During the time young Samuel was minister to the Lord under Eli, a revelation of the Lord was uncommon and vision infrequent. One day, Eli was asleep in his usual place. His eyes had lately grown so weak that he could not see. The lamp of God was not yet extinguished, and Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The Lord called to Samuel, who answered, Here I am. Samuel ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. I did not call you, Eli said. Go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Again the Lord called Samuel, who rose and went to Eli. Here I am, he said. You called me. But Eli answered, I did not call you, my son. Go back to sleep. At that time, Samuel was not familiar with the Lord, because the Lord had not yet revealed anything to him. The Lord called Samuel again for the third time. Getting up and going to Eli, he said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So Eli said to Samuel, Go to sleep, and if you are called, reply, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When Samuel went to sleep in his place, the Lord came and revealed his presence, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not permitting any word of his to be without effect. Thus all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, came to know that Samuel was an accredited prophet of the Lord. Hi, I'm Sister Carla Gonçalves. I'm from Mount St. Mary's Abbey in Rentham, Massachusetts. We belong to a contemplative order, commonly known as the Trappists. Um, we have monks and nuns in our order. And the name of the order is the Cistercians of the Strict Observance. I've been in a monastery now for a little bit over eight years, but to tell you the truth, it feels more like 30 because of the amount and the intensity of the changes um, the discoveries, the things I've had to let go and that which I had to embrace since hearing, discerning, and responding to the voice of God within me. Um, the theme when I heard um, that this was in Cardinal Sean's heart of hearing the voice of God made me even more nervous than I usually get when I need to um, give a talk because of how unique, how many details and how personal this hearing, discerning, and responding to the voice of God can be because of how unique we all are. And so I was trying to think and, and praying really hard of how can I make this a common um, experience? How can I make this something that I will speak and that will speak to your heart the same way that it spoke to me? And so as much as I tried um, to come up with something, it was during prayer that this word came to me. And it's not the easiest word to work with because the word is chaos. And the reason why I think Jesus gave me this word was because of three phases in my life. The chaos before I heard his call, the chaos of during hearing his call, and especially the chaos of after hearing his call. I was a little um, even more tense when the word came because how do I really explain this and then I heard in a homily from a priest not too long ago to say that when God intervenes in our life, it's meant to disturb us, to shock us. And he gave us the example of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of St. Joseph at the time of the Annunciation. It was definitely a moment of shock, of disturbance. And so I thought, well, that does describe much of my experience of discernment and um, answering the call to religious life. So the chaos of before hearing his call was actually quite comfortable to me. Um, I was very fond of life before the call came in. I was in my early 20s, very active in my parish. I attended two parishes with the Brazilian community. I'm from Brazil and also with the American community, serving in all the different ministries. I was um, working on my master's degree. I had a career or a job already in the career I wanted to follow. I was doing a Brazilian radio show at night. 
I was also volunteering for many organizations. I helped with my family. My lifestyle spoke about what my personality was. I'm an extrovert and that was the chaos that I loved and I had a lot of meaning and fulfillment into everything. But all of a sudden something shifted. I started feeling a bit of an emptiness, um, some sort of dissatisfaction with what I was doing even though everything was meaningful and I loved everything I did. I couldn't really tell at that moment that that was the voice of God. I couldn't recognize it as God speaking to me, especially because I felt it as a, something negative, a dissatisfaction and emptiness that I felt I just needed to fill. Not recognizing it as God's voice, my instinctive reaction was, well, I just need to do more. I need to do more activities, I need to um, read more books, I need to add adoration hours before the Blessed Sacrament, and so I just added the noise, I added the chaos. And to me, um, the way that I process life, especially since entering the religious life, has been through Scripture. Scripture has been my way to God and God's way to me. It's where I find strength, it's where I find direction, it's where he consoles me, it's where he corrects me. Um, but most importantly, it's where I find a way to sieve through some of my life experiences, finding the divine and the human aspects of my life into his will. So the passage that helped me to look into this phase of chaos in my life was the first book of Samuel, the call of Samuel. And I'm sure you're familiar with this passage and, and, and with the call of Samuel. Samuel was consecrated to God even before he was in his mother's womb. As a toddler, he is handed over to prophet Eli and he lives in the temple, he serves in the temple. He's sleeping in the sanctuary right next to the Ark of the Covenant. Talk about intimacy with our God. And then one night, God says, Samuel, Samuel. And what does Samuel do? He gets up, leaves the sanctuary and goes to Eli and says, here I am, you called me. He doesn't even ask, have you called me? No, he knows, he's sure, he heard his name, and this is what's familiar to him. The voice of Eli usually calls him, so he goes to what's familiar. And so often, even today, when I feel a disturbance within me or, or the voice of God asking something of me, my tendency is to go to that which is familiar, and that's what I did. Well, Samuel had Eli, the prophet, to teach him how to hear and how to respond to his voice, to God's voice. I didn't have an Eli at the time, so God had to be a little more creative. And the way he did it was through Facebook, out of all places. But there was an ad, um, and the ad for it was for this website that had come up with a series of questions um, that someone could answer in order to find their mission within the church. And depending on your answers, they would connect you with different institutes, different um, prayer groups, and also religious orders. For me, this wasn't very threatening. It was safe because I had never thought of being, becoming a religious. So I felt that this was a way for me to find what it is that I needed to do because adding more chaos was still not fulfilling that emptiness or eliminating that dissatisfaction that I started to feel and be uncomfortable with. About two days after I, I filled out this, um, these questions and submitted the questions, I get an email from the vocation director at Mount St. Mary's Abbey in Rantham, my community today. And they were inviting me to spend the weekend with them, it's called the Monastic Weekend, and experience the life of prayer, hear the sisters' vocation stories, ask questions. I felt, again, it's safe. I can go, I don't have a religious vocation anyway, it would be a good experience. And this is where the second phase of the chaos started to really raise up. I started to realize by the end of that weekend that the emptiness was being filled. And more strangely even was that it was being filled as well as expanding. So that the feeling was not necessarily the dissatisfaction with what was, but it became a desire for what I was experiencing throughout that weekend. This chaos brought about even more chaos because now I understood that I had a desire for something that I did not know, something I did not recognize. 
one of the lines that I find very beautiful in that um, passage of, of 1 Samuel 3 is that it speaks clearly that for Samuel, he was not yet familiar with the voice of the Lord. And so for me, these feelings, especially with the fear coming up, everything was um, just unfamiliar and unknown. So the fear started and I started replying to the fear saying, this could not be. I could not have a vocation to the contemplative life because I'm an extrovert. You know, the sister's mode of prayer is meditation and chant. My mode of prayer is loud music, hands up in the air, praise the Lord. I'm part of the charismatic renewal movement. I'm not compatible. This is not my call. The sister's mode of witness is stable in one place, praising God and interceding for the world. My mode of witness was reaching out, serving, being out in places that I, I could reach and preach and speak and hear and serve. So again, it's not compatible. This could not be for me. The sisters observe silence. I organize cultural festivals and fundraising parties. There is absolutely no way this is not for me. But certainly the Lord is calling me to religious life. So then I put that aside, not for me. And I started discerning with other religious orders, active orders. And as beautiful as it was, as touching as it was, um, to be able to witness and experience church, I still could not take away the longing and the desire that I had to live more of that deep encounter with the Lord in prayer through praise and intercession. The fear also that started coming up was because I could see the many graces that I had received from the Lord that built my faith to where it was at that moment. The family life that I had, I kept telling God, I didn't choose the family you gave me. You gave me a beautiful family, some, a way that I can participate in it, and now you're telling me to let go of everything. How could this be? I also thanked him for so many years for the opportunity to go to college. I hadn't even signed up to go to college and the opportunity just came. My major was in communication. How is it now that you're calling me to live the contemplative life hidden in praise and intercession, but hidden? All of these questions and these fears started to come up. And at this moment, I realized that I wasn't sure what to do with this tension of the fear and the desire. And it was the moment I knew that I needed then an Eli in my life. I went to my pastor and I asked if he could help me find a spiritual director that I could expose these fears, that I could expose these desires. I tried with friends and I tried with family, but they knew me as much as I knew myself. And so their question was, how can this be? <laughs> it was the same questions that I had. So I needed someone from the outside that could guide me um, and help me to really express all of this and bring it forward um, to the Lord and discern it with him. The other passage that comes to mind for me is the, um, the passage of the call of Peter. Peter is just a fisherman and a family man. And all of a sudden the Lord appears to him, gives him the miraculous catch of fish, making him the greatest fisherman in the beach at that moment. And he knows that if he goes back to the beach, he has that whole crowd that was there with Jesus. He could sell all his fish and he could do and, and, and be the fisherman and the family man that he always felt called to be. But all of a sudden the Lord says, no, come and follow me. And he left everything and followed the Lord, even the graces that the Lord himself had given to him. All of this was stirring within me, and I needed to really experience what this desire was and embrace the fears, not to eliminate it because it's part of life, but certainly embrace it and understand it within the context of God's will. One of the beautiful ways that my spiritual director helped me to go through this process was through detachment. He would tell me, you know, when you have a family gathering, go to the family gathering, enjoy the family gathering, but leave 10 minutes early and use that moment for prayer and see how that feels. And although I wanted to be with my family, although I loved my family and that was very precious to me, 
that moment of leaving behind and entering into prayer with the Lord did not separate myself from my family in a deeper way and integrated my life with my family life. So these little steps that I had to take throughout the, these moments of um, discernment, um, these experiments, these experiences, discerning with religious orders um, that were not necessarily contrary to my desires, uh, but certainly not the contemplative life that I had that strange desire for, but also experiencing the life of the contemplatives with the community that had attracted me to the religious life in the first place. There were very important steps um, and, and very grace-filled moments in my life. I would like to suggest two books um, that were extremely helpful to me during my um, time of discernment, both before and um, during um, my formation in religious life. And the first one is The Vowed Life by Adrian Van Kam. It's a beautiful book that really puts together um, the spiritual and the human aspects of our, of our life with the Lord. And even though it is for a uh, more active religious, it's, it's a really important book to, to um, understand ourselves before the Lord in our true humanity. It's a wonderful book. The other book is In Defense of Pur Purity by the philosopher Hildebrand. Um, he has a wonderful and almost poetic way of praising the married life. And he, de de um, he explains the married life in the context of um, the, the fidelity to Christ in the married life throughout the whole first part of the book. It's so beautiful and so powerful that the second part of the book where he devotes to chastity, it just, chastity makes sense because of the married life. So it's also a wonderful book um, and, a, and a book that truly helped me to, to discern what the Lord was asking of me. I ask you for your prayers for myself and for my community that we may be faithful to the call that God has given us. And I assure you of my prayers um, throughout this Lenten season, um, Easter, and we meet also in the Eucharist. God bless you. Hello, I'm Bishop Reed. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's retreat presentation. We hope it has been inspiring and enriching for you as we enter into these final days of Lent. And we ask God to bless you as we prepare to recall Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, his last supper with his chosen band, his arrest and passion, his death on the cross, and of course, his glorious resurrection on Easter. In these holy days, May God bless you and protect you and all those you love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.